This is the How to Write Funny podcast. I'm Scott Dickers, and on this episode, I'm talking to Sean Tejirachi, the mind behind one of the funniest websites on the internet, Liar Town USA. Sean, I'm very excited to meet you. Thank you, Scott. I've been a fan of your work for a long time. Your work is not only funny, but it's beautiful and it's unsung and it's just (laughs) in a special category. (laughs) Thank you. So I don't mean to make things awkward by just heaping praise on you right out of the gate. Yeah. But for a lot of people who don't know what Liar Town USA is, and I preach about it constantly and often run into people who just have no idea. Right. Unless they're in the comedy business, then they've heard of it. Can you explain what it is? Uh, probably not that well. I mean, I've in my life, I have to explain it to people, and I don't do that great a job. I end up saying it's full of fake things. Um, fake, fake movie synopses and uh, uh, record covers and book covers and... Um, small objects and collectibles and whatever it qualifies as satire i'm sure and uh but it's definitely parody yeah yeah and satirical as well at times i've i'm still working out the um i've never been entirely clear on the definition of satire oh which maybe i mean i've heard different ones i've i've really tried but to me parody is when you mimic another form and make fun of it Or make fun of anything while mimicking another form. Sure. And you do that pretty consistently. And satire is when you have an axe to grind or a point to make and you're using humor to do it. Parody is one of the many tools that you can use in satire. And you use all of them. But (laughs) parody is the format that you use. That that sounds great, actually. So another bunch of the parodies that you do are calendars. Yeah. And... You did a book. And when you said movie synopses, you're talking about the screen on Netflix before you play the movie. Yeah. Things like things like that. Yeah, when you pause the the screen, you you eventually get the the summary. And don't forget the old magazines, the old porn mags. Oh right. Porn is a big part of it. I was just looking at one the other day, the magazine Pals. (laughs) I mean, (laughs) it's just beautiful. It's so (laughs) <laughs> unique and so funny and I really appreciate humor that I can't immediately deconstruct and explain why it's funny oh that's good and yeah so and usually the way that works is the more tools you're using right <laughs> parody plus character plus reference plus meta humor all this other stuff the more difficult it is for the brain to like segment it out and <laughs> figure it out and define it. That's good. I'm very, and so, I'm happy about that. Yeah. And I look at something like that and I remember Conan O'Brien said this when he first discovered the onion, he said, it's the sort of publication that just makes you angry that you didn't think of it first because <laughs> it's so clear and s- such a distinct voice and so funny. And that's how I feel about liar town USA. It's like, who, who are you and how do you do this and how did you get so good at it and how have we never heard of you? Like those, <laughs> <laughs> those are the big questions. Uh, well, which part do you want where, me to answer? So where did you come from? Um, I came from, I was born in LA and then spent time in central California, Bakersfield area. And I just went through Bakersfield. It's a pretty nondescript. <laughs> it's a beautiful barren hellscape. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, when I was 17, I think I moved to, or 16, I moved to Oregon to Eugene and finished high school, almost tried to go to U of O, didn't dropped out. Then, uh, I think 19 or 20 moved to Portland. I was there for, for the nineties and then moved around the country a little bit, just Midwest, New York, and then decided I need to get the hell out of New York and went back here. So... In Portland in the 90s, that's sort of when you were adulting for the first time, it sounds like. Yeah. And, 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 you know, the Portlandia stuff is pretty right on. Yeah. So I was there for that. And, uh, I mean, I, yeah, that's where, yeah, I was adulting, as you put it. And that's where I sort of developed the different skill sets, which were separate at the time, but eventually went into Liartown. 
Yeah, so tell me about those. What line of work were you pursuing as an adult, or were you working minimum wage jobs or whatever? Uh, what was I doing? I was working at news weeklies, making okay. ads, a lot of that. Um, I worked for, I think, most of the weeklies in Portland at one time or another. Including and, the Portland Mercury. Right. Portland Mercury, when they started, uh, I was their first art director. Right. Well, Joe Newton was in, in Seattle at The Stranger. I went and, up there and learned the ropes from him and then came down and worked on the paper as it, as it started. Right. And we were just talking about Tim Keck, the founder of the Portland Mercury, and The Stranger, yep. who is also one of the founders of The Onion, who is both of our, one of our favorite people. He's a heavenly angel. <laughs> Beautiful, beautiful angel. Beautiful man. It's true. <laughs> Hi, Tim. Hi, Tim. He'll never hear this. <laughs> He's too busy. Oh, well. But It's a real asshole sometimes. Yeah, no. So how did you get those jobs? How did you get to be a designer? Uh, I was, um, when I was in Eugene, I guess the, the first actual graphic design thing I did was fake, which is funny in retrospect. Um, uh, it wasn't some... Uh, there was, I was doing posters. I wanted to do rock and roll posters for you know local bands. I thought that was great and cool and I could really love that. But I didn't know anybody in a band. So I made up a band and made, and I worked at Kinko's at the time, so I had free copies and I put up posters and things like that. And, and then ironically, it led to an actual job doing posters for the Wow Hall in Eugene. Somebody and, recognized your work at Kinko's or something? Or? No, no, it was, I think I went and I asked them, can I do things? And they said, do you have any work? And I said this. And they go, oh, you're that guy who does that, you know. So they had seen him. Yeah, but it's okay, a small great. town. Everyone's, and sure, I, I'm, I'm sure still. putting him up outside the wow hall probably helped. Sure. <laughs> wasn't quite, wasn't quite famous or anything. But, you know, it got you seen. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, then I started doing them for the wow hall and, and eventually I met, Mike King and Kathy Malloy, who did the zine Snipe Hunt. And okay. Mike was in Portland. Kathy was moving up there. So I moved up there, too, because Eugene was, you know, the town where you went to high school. Right. Nothing's going on in Eugene. Yeah. So then you're doing a lot of this design work. And then you mentioned the other skills that you gleaned. Doing Photoshop. I started learning Photoshop and just bits and pieces from people who knew it. And I, you know, who would show me how they just did this one thing and pieced it together and you know slow yeah so i was learning photoshop in the 90s as well and i remember going through the evolution of photoshop mm -hmm. and in the beginning there were no layers no and the no. only way you could do photo montages or composites was cutting and pasting and then option erasing do you remember that did you ever have to do what that? What was option erase? You'd hold down option and erase one thing that you pasted on top and it would reveal what was underneath. Oh, and that oh, was oh. kind of the only way you could do a two-layered thing. Right. I think my method was to make it on a different document. Okay. Like I just had, I would do this long way of making different pictures, like uh, one layer on one document, basically. I and, see. And, and then... Composite them later yeah, somehow. And yeah. So yeah. really that, yeah, I was there from the floppy disk stage. Yeah. Yeah. So you're learning Photoshop, you're learning design. You must have learned writing humor at some point. No. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, the first humor, I guess, I wrote was uh, when I was art director of the Mercury, and I think it was 2000 or 1999. Um, they would have that, uh, that kind of recurring, the joke was it was always getting shut down the little column that was always getting canned the next week so okay. it was always a recurring like new thing new column they'd call it okay and uh anyone who had an idea ended up yeah sure do it whatever and so it was a very low pressure so i did some of those it was really low pressure and fun and and no one no one was sitting there watching you know judging it or whatever so i kind of got that i got all the fun without any of the pressure right and if i recall you wrote an article extolling the virtues of drowning, <laughs> yeah. things like that. Yeah, that was, I mean, and then at some point it's easy to go in house. So if you're, you know, even if you're the art director and you've got all this other visual stuff going on, can you write something? We're all writing something, you know, everybody it's, pitches in. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, and that's and how the onion was early on. It's like yep. our ad sales guy wrote a column. Yep. <laughs> that's, and, and I wrote columns like small columns and, and then when the, um, the Iraq invasion happened. Uh, I wrote 
a, like a four part uh, like embedded journalist thing from as if Fake. I were yeah okay yeah, yeah. hopefully yeah <laughs> thank God yeah and so I got to do all this fun stuff and not think much of it and it wasn't beloved or or anything it was just run of the mill and and but it was really fun and and got me um wanting to like realize that if i ever need to do it i can do these little bits myself had you ever done any writing before that like in high school or college or anything not really i mean you i'm must sure there's there's you know tiny things i wrote for right. zines but and, and crap hound the intro to crap hound does that count That's really... well when did crap hound happen and tell us what crap hound is oh. for those of us who don't know crap hound is uh not anything like liar town nothing funny really it's just um it's a zine full of high contrast images from advertising and commercial art. And it's, you know, like each issue has its own topic or, or combination of topics. Hands, hearts, and eyes, death, telephone, scissors, that kind of thing. Clip art. Except I wouldn't ever, ever call it clip art. Why is that? <laughs> well, I don't think of it as, I don't think anyone's going to use it for clip art. Didn't they, though? Didn't people use it to make band They would make it posters and stuff like that. And I'd put a warning in there like, you know, hey, don't do this. This is whatever. This is a scholarly look at whatever. And, and you didn't have the rights to these images? No. Okay. No. I figured it was easier to get um, forgiveness than permission. Right. Which you didn't even need to get, probably. The only uh, time I ever ran into problems was with the, uh, the sex and kitchen gadgets issue and the um, Tom of Finland Foundation. Hmm. I had used little images that were uh, from from a old uh, porn catalog, so it was like secondhand. I just put, oh, they they use these things. I'm going to use them and take it right out. And and they were uh, the, the foundation was extremely nice about it and charged me a couple hundred bucks to use them in perpetuity. Wow! And great. then and then they even gave me more stuff to use wonderful. for the next issue. So <laughs> that's wonderful. But but yeah, it's it's all pictures and it's nothing funny. And I would write it's. It's got an intro and a thank yous, and that's it. There's no very little editorial. And I would write the editorial for that, the intro, and then usually, because I w was bored, I would make the... Uh, the credits were always arranged. The credits were sort of liar town before liar town. They were always something fake, like a, a yoga sign-up sheet or on a bulletin board or um, a billboard uh, top 100 magazine page or a map, you know, fake did, towns. Did you ever see some of Chris Ware's early work where yeah. he did that sort of stuff? <laughs> yeah, the ads. It was like an old toothpaste ad where he would tell a personal story in there. Yeah. <laughs> where did you see that, by the way? Uh, Reading Frenzy. Reading Frenzy, okay. Yeah. Uh, Reading Frenzy was the uh, alternative independent bookstore in Portland, and I was closely involved when it started. Um, and uh, so I would sometimes you know, be behind the counter. And Got it. So I'd have time to read everything. And when you do that, did you use real names in the credits or did you use some of your delightful made up fake names? Both. Okay. I usually like, uh, well, I, there was always an angle that would let me put fake stuff in. So if it was the billboard thing, I would have the, the producer, I think was the actual person. And, um, the, uh, there was a fake song and the fake album. And I think, uh, and you know, yeah, fake band, of course. Of course. So, yeah, there was always room to fuck around, and and you know there was a TV uh, TV show or sorry a TV guide that was one of them, an early one. So that was, and I actually reuse stuff. I self cannibalize. Nice. So where did the impulse to want to create and write come from? Do you suppose? Uh, I know where it came from. Um, I was in uh, St. Louis and I was really bored. I mean, when was this? 2001. Okay. And you were uh, living there? Yeah. Yep. How did that happen? Uh, I wanted I wanted to get out of Portland and Art Chantry. Do you know Art Chantry? Don't know that person. Poster legend. Oh, okay. From Seattle. Uh, he and his uh, girlfriend at the time were living in a house. Had bought a house there, and they said, "Why don't you come on out and see St. Louis?" And you know, there's whatever it's a good place and they were trying to i think get friends to visit and move and whatever and i did i thought sure and uh so i mean i'd never been there i didn't have any connection to st louis beyond them and it was a great weird town but i was still bored you know um 
but I had uh, now and then an idea would occur to me and I'd look around to write it down and I didn't have anything so I'd write down a little scrap of paper and put it in my pocket and at some point I realized I reached in my pocket I remember being at the train station I reach in and there's like 20 pieces of paper and I thought that's real close to something a crazy person would do so why don't you go get a blank book and write this shit down and you can have one place to put it and that's fine and that's not crazy that's that's, that's a normal. totally normal thing that's to do like a writer then <laughs> <laughs> and uh so i started putting it in there and because i was bored i would just write and that was my rule i put anything in no matter how stupid it wasn't for anyone to see or be impressed by or anything like that and eventually I filled it up and started on another one. And then I moved to New York for a while and that was miserable. And mm. so that became like, well, I'll just focus on this and just play this game with myself of how many dumb ideas I can think of. So a couple of questions. Number one, do you still have those books? Yeah, I'm on That's 21 great. now. That's great. Yeah. Someday you could publish those. Well, I'm, I actually, uh, this is a painful admission. I, I realized having them isn't really that useful because it's like, oh, where I had an idea about, you know, tow trucks or whatever. But how, where are you going to find it? So I, I designed a FileMaker Pro database. And then I, <laughs> I had someone, since I don't know how to program it, I, had, I hired someone to do it. I designed the interface and said, can you make this work? And they did. And, and so I digitized it all. That's fantastic. <laughs> That's fantastic. It's a, I'm not sure why uh, it's embarrassing, but... It's some sort of compulsion. <laughs> you did the same thing with fonts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have the most organized font catalog of any designer I've ever met. Because, and it's not... They don't not, have one. No, nobody has a good one. I'm not compelled to do that with just anything. My house is not, you know, this model of, of library science or anything like that. It's, You're not like Rain Man with OCD no, doing God, no. this stuff all the time. It's a matter of survival. And, and right, right. also, like, you know, you can take all the take a library, a public library, and shake it and dump all the books out and you've still got everything in the library. It's just kind of useless. Right. So it's the organization that makes it, you know, important. And I find the easier I can do, I can access and find things, the faster I can get on to the, the good part. That's great. So you could publish those books in a series or you could put them all together in a big volume. Man, it would be embarrassing. Like, because it really is like one out of every hundred is good. And I, don't hear, I hear what you're saying. I hear what you're saying. There's such a dumb things, you know, like one letter, like this is one letter different than another. And I have a little category on the, the FileMaker database where it's just, I can just put a new word in and note that it's one letter different than another word, you know stupid that's pointless. so great yeah so the other question i had was why were you miserable in new york it's i fucking hate that place i hmm. mean it's what nice part of the city were you in uh brooklyn and worked in manhattan what neighborhood in brooklyn uh park slope okay and then and at the pleasant time enough for most people williamsburg at the edge of williamsburg also but it was the most i've ever paid for the shittiest place i've ever lived Right, and at that time, it, it, it was pretty rough, right? around. It was clearly coming up, because everyone would tell me, like, oh, this used to be a really bad part of town. Oh, so it know. was coming up, okay. Yeah. But, I mean, it's great, I think, if you're 19, but I was 30, something like that. Okay. And, uh, you know, it's great if you're there, and because it's energizing and everything like that. But it's like visiting, I think of it as visiting Disneyland. It's great, it's fun. You know, try and do your laundry there or go to the DMV and... Everything's a production yeah, in New yeah, York. A whole day spent. Right. There's a thing a friend of mine there calls the, the door tax. Whenever you leave your house, there's a $20 door tax. Yeah. No matter yeah. where you go or what you do, you're going to pay $20. And I, well, I was extremely poor. Yeah. So that really, yeah. Expensive, big production. Yeah. So miserable. It was great to see and great to be there, but man, just... Did you make friends? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I worked at the New York Press at Great. the time and um so it was really interesting and everything but it was so intense and tiring and i was angry all the time too i remember mm. remember feeling like god I, I hate this feeling it's a high stress city yeah and and i think too it it's it was the most uh provincial place i've ever been like really? people you've never been to boston then it's true i mean i passed through it but but all you know why would anyone go anywhere else everything comes to new york you just wait here and it's the center of everything and right. you know everything else is a failed version of new york a failed smaller version right and i thought like 
if everyone wouldn't have, if people just shut the fuck up for three consecutive minutes about how great it is, they would realize this isn't actually that great. You know, there are like, strikes against it. I think yeah. it's great for many of the reasons that you mentioned. There, there is kind of a bottomless well of talent and resources and everything does kind of come to New York. But those other things you mentioned, that it is a production, it is very expensive, it's very high stress, those are real. Yeah. And those are real drawbacks to it. Yeah, and I don't, like, I'm not energized by by fighting the tide of humanity, you know, to get from point A to point B. And Yeah. To, to make it in New York, you kind of have to be surfing that tide. Yeah, yeah. And you don't strike me as much of a surfer. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you took that as a compliment. That's good. Yeah. So, and you were doing design work for the New York Press? Yeah, I was uh, the art director. Okay, great. And uh, So that's yeah. your profession, primarily, it sounds like, throughout your adult life. Yep. Has been doing design art direction yep design of books and, and weeklies and posters and and some music stuff i worked for a couple of record labels over the years so and then when did crap hound start happening 94 oh really early yeah okay and how often did you do that and were you doing that through your time in st louis new york etc no when i i stopped when i was uh, when i left portland in 2000 okay early 2001 so there was a huge gap between Crap Hound and Liar Town. Yeah. When well, uh, typically, actually, I, I restarted doing, re I started doing reprints, enlarged reprints of Crap Hound at some point. And so I was doing that. With a small publisher. Yeah, yeah. Because at first they were just a self published zine. Yeah, and it wasn't a, that wasn't the problem. It was just, I was tired of dealing with distribution and everything. Like, I just yeah. want the fun parts and not the, the boring. Right. How did you distribute it in the 90s? Uh, through. I can't remember. There were a couple distributors. Um, so like zine distributors yeah, that would exactly. take them to like independent bookstores and stuff yep. like that. Yep. Interesting. Yep. I didn't even know about and that. And I would send out thousands of them, you know, and you'd trade with everyone. Yeah, I had no idea that world existed. And I probably could have taken advantage of it with The Onion because we were always struggling to find newsstand distribution for The Onion. And the, the Onion news. was too good for that. <laughs> they, I mean, the, the, uh, the early Onion. Okay, I haven't seen maybe. the early stuff, but, but around... The, my first view of it was it was pretty polished already and mid 90s yeah yeah so we had been at it for about six years at that point it was before we would get copies i mean i'm sure you've heard this many times but we'd get copies before it was ever before you started distributing it in um in the actual cities you know yeah we would send it to bookstores yeah in various cities so like one person would get a copy and then we'd all go have beers and laugh right <laughs> well that's <cool. laughs> it was very it was a very good time Thank you. So give me like the genesis of Liar Town. You moved back to the Northwest. Uh, uh, L.A. I moved back to you L.A. You moved back to L.A. Okay. Yeah. And after New York. Yep. And you probably get more design work. That's your job, your day job. Yeah. I mean, I, through this all, I was working for Feral House, and I still do. You know, Which the, is a... a independent publisher, sort okay. of a culture fringe oddities art type of stuff got it and then what's the genesis of the liar town blog uh the liar town blog well i was on twitter at the time this was like 2011 2013 or two those years or whatever mm -hmm. and um i was trying to uh, i would make these things and post them just because that it's easier than writing a joke sometimes just making a dumb book cover and then you know that's fine and i but I'd see them, someone would take it out of the, the tweet and put it in their own tweet and pass it off as their own. And there's no way to really fight that. You can't be, you know, dick cop forever on the internet. So, so instead of fighting it, I just thought, okay, and I don't want to put, you know, a little copyright that just kills everything, you know, putting a little copyright symbol at the bottom and a signature. And Yes. Uh, so I thought the thing I'll do is I'll have a depository where I can post these things. I can put them on Twitter the way whatever I was doing, but they'll also be on this thing at the same time. And that way anyone who cares can find the first appearance of it. It'll be time stamped, dated. You know, that's that. And and it'll just serve this purpose of I don't have to think much about it after that. And uh so it became and then I realized at some point like Twitter's a shithole and I would rather just keep doing Liar Town, you know, then I can have all the parts I like and virtually none that I don't. That's a pattern I see. 
Yeah. Try to eliminate all the things you don't like. It is. Just do the things you like. I mean, it's a great pattern. Well, yeah, I don't want to bang my head against the wall. And, and yeah, and that's, that's what everyone does. You know? And life is short. Yep. You should enjoy it. More of what you like, less of what you don't. Yep. So you do Liar Town for how many years before you start getting a little bit of attention or traction? With I, I think I started, I posted stuff like I did a dump of everything that had been on Twitter so far, I think in early 2012. And, uh, I don't know the attention, the attention is hard to quantify or, or figure out what was coming when, you know? Um, yeah, I, I, I'm not that into the publicity of it, the self-promotion in fact, that kind of grosses me out a little bit mm. and not necessarily to my benefit, but I like doing it and, and I find that it doesn't, nothing improves when you're trying to jam it down everyone's throat and remind them how great it is constantly, you know, it, it's. Yeah. yeah. You, you have this very Gen X vibe that a lot of my peers have about promotion and marketing, which is that art should succeed on its own merits and you shouldn't be self-promotional about it and you shouldn't have to pitch it and you don't want to be part of the, the carnival barking crowd. It's, it's not like a top down decision. I mean, you're right, but I, it's not like I decided that that's better than this. I just was on the receiving end. I've been on the receiving end of all these people, all these self promoters. And, and I've seen like the naked desperation and, you know, I didn't want to You see that for a while and you become allergic to it. And you certainly don't want to do it yourself when it's your turn. That, I think that's part of why it's not appealing is that it does feel desperate. Yeah. And when someone like you comes out with a product like Liar Town, it was something that is, it's just done because you want to do it mm-hmm. and you think it's really funny and you just put it out there and you don't push it on people. You don't have to, like you say, desperately beg people to look at it or, hey, look at me, whatever. Yeah. But you're almost doing the opposite. You're almost hiding it. You just put it on Tumblr. So it's not, <laughs> it's hard to find and it, it doesn't make it easy. So when you do find it, it's a discovery. And I found that that was really helpful for The Onion. People felt like they were discovering it. Yeah. And people want to discover something. They don't want to be sold something. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, you're right. It does hamper you a lot. And it's like shooting yourself in the foot. In this day and age, we live in an attention economy. Everything's about how do you get the attention. So having something that's purposefully not trying to get attention is a is a very bold play. And it's a long term play. Well, it, it I mean, and the way you're saying it, it's all true. But it also it's not some it's not a know, play. Yeah, it's not a play. It's just how you want to do it. Because I, I really just don't want to be another one of those people out there pushing their thing. I, it's, it's the most, of all the things I've done, this project is the most me. You know, like they're my dumb ideas that make me laugh that I wanted to see. And, and since other people weren't making them, I got to make them because I would be happy if other people have. But I, I wanted to do these things for me and I put them out there and it's, and I don't want to make it sound like this reverse snobbery of like, oh, you know, like, oh, and people, I don't roll my eyes at humanity. That kind of thing irritates me as well. I, I'm very glad that people like it and, and I'm glad you like it. And I don't think that's like, I'm thrilled that like certain people have said to me, they like it. And that's like Patton Oswald was an early yeah, person to come yeah. out and say, Hey, this is brilliant. Yep. And probably got you a lot of people discovering you. Oh, yeah. And that's, uh, by the way, that's another reason I kind of take this, the publicity or the notoriety that whatever has come with a pretty big grain of salt. Because I got these big boosts from from people that have been very nice and supportive, yourself included. And, and so, but it gives this artificial sense of like, wow, I've really taken off. It's like, no, <laughs> you you've just piggybacked on a push from, you know whatever other people have helped immensely and and you can see it in real time you know with the the follower counts go up and spike and everything right but you know it it may be an artificial boost but the people who like it and continue to follow you and glom on are people who have then discovered it yeah. regardless of oh, how yeah. they discovered it like they're legitimate fans. no no i don't turn my nose up at any of it but i but it's this kind of curious side aspect of it not the the goal and, right. and sometimes, you know, flying under the radar is, is easier. There's less pressure. Like, I don't, 
I always have to check, like, am I doing this to please people? And, you know, people want more of certain things that they like, and it's fine as long as I want to do it. But like the Apple Cabin stuff with the, f- the fake grocery flyers. Yeah, those are wonderful. But but I, I can do them in my sleep, and I feel like it's cheating, you know, like, oh. And you've done enough, maybe you feel. Yeah. Like. And you, didn't you do a calendar of those? Yeah, I did. And yeah. that was uh, that was kind of the, I felt like, there, I capped it, and I can That was your gift to down. those people who begged for more. Yeah, and, they, and I still get people saying, hey, when's another calendar? It's like, I don't, man, not everything has <laughs> to be beaten either. into the ground <laughs> mercilessly. Well, that's an interesting thing that you bring up because that's another thing that I wanted to say we would do at The Onion, but it was really something I would do at The Onion where everyone else, we would have a feature that would be really popular Mm -hmm. and I would kill it because I thought, no, it's too popular. Yeah. But now we're just, you know, throwing red meat to the fans and we should be challenging them and we should be doing something that they don't expect because the whole point of comedy is that it should be unexpected. And if you're just giving them more of what they want, you're not surprising them anymore. And that's why Steve Martin quit doing comedy because he would oh. go out and do his act to these huge stadiums. Right. And they weren't really laughing at his jokes anymore. It was just this steady stream of cheers. Yeah. And it's like, I can't deal with this. I can't do this. Yeah. That sounds, uh, it sounds familiar. I mean, I just, I mean, it's such a small version of that, but yeah, you know that you can do this in your sleep and put it out there and people will love it. Whatever. The same people all the time will love it. Mm hmm. But you could do an Apple Cabin comic strip yeah. every day for the rest no, of your people life. People would and it say, would like, oh, very popular. <laughs> why don't you do one of those one a day, 365 <laughs> right. page things? Right. Like, Jesus, man. <laughs> oh, I, I, I admire that. I, I also think of it as reserving. Like, I will still put stuff in Liar Town that doesn't necessarily fit with the rest of it. And I like that it's incongruous because I think of it as reserving. The right to do more of that. Yeah, I like that too. It's you, again, you don't expect some yeah. of the stuff. It just comes out of left field. Yeah, because it's it's going to be for me, and I don't want to ever feel obligated to do it. That kills the joy, you know. I don't. I'm happy to do the stuff people like, but it has to coincide with what I like, and and I, I also like that. They, I've I keep seeing, Liar Town used to be good, you know. You see that? Yeah, like what happened, like. <laughs> And and it's not it's not common, but it's regular. Huh. Like, just you know, my God, you do anything different, and people are like, I, I was on board for a while, but now I'm, you know, they stopped doing the Apple Cab, so I'm <laughs> yeah. not into it anymore. Yeah, the old I like the old Sean. Like, I don't know if anyone's broken this to you yet, but you're an artist, not an entertainer. I fucking hate art stuff artists i mean you know so that's what you are you're I'm doing very it because cynical you love about it. that you're doing it for yourself sure and you're not doing it for marketing or platform building or profit okay if that yeah no if that qualifies but then i'm up there with a housewife who cooks great <laughs> meals for people that she you know because she likes cooking i mean right. i really do associate myself more with that like hmm. I'm, you know, I'm making these things that other people consume, but I'm doing it because I really like it. Not because I feel indebted, like we're obligated to do it, but also not because I, you know, it's not some grand selfless artistic urge. It's much more selfish and, and practical. I think of it as practical. And how is it practical? Is it you getting steam off? Mm-hmm. In what In what way does it get steam off for you? Because you have a day job. And maybe you don't get to be as creative in the job. Is that kind of what it is? Or is there other stuff at work? It le- well, it always helps with the jobs. Like I've found that I really, I wouldn't want to be doing this full time. I like having the job where I take direction from other people. It's other people's books. They, they know what they want. I go with that and make it look good. But I don't want, um, but you know, all the frustration that might build up over time doing other people's projects, it, I, I don't feel that because I have this place where I can put my stuff exactly the way I want it. I get that itch scratched. Um, and yeah, it is blowing off steam. It's like, uh, you know, this. it definitely is some sort of mental thing where I really want it. I feel really physical relief when I get to see the thing that I had in my mind's eye. That there, it's done, and that's what, that's the best version of it, or it's close enough, But but it it's a relief to get this stuff out because I've been thinking about some of this stuff for years, you know, and to see it realized, even if I had to do it, the fact I have to do it is just a, 
byproduct. Like it's a, an unfortunate side effect. <laughs> but sure, I'll take it. Um, yeah, that does sound a lot like art. Yeah, but uh, my view of art is that art is anything that uh, one person, any field where one person can do better than another. I've been hmm. thinking about it. Interesting. <laughs> let's, uh, yeah, let's get into the nature of art. That'll be yeah, riveting. I mean, <laughs> it will, because I don't know anything about art, and I honestly don't care for it. I really like entertainment. Same. I like something that makes me laugh or makes me feel something. I don't like something that makes me, I don't know, just like appreciate its creation or its beauty in a way that it's, it's too subtle to like define. I don't know. And maybe I just don't understand. I really don't know anything about art. Well, I think it's one of those, it's always frustrating talking about it because the term has never been properly defined. It's like love where people can talk and like literally forever about it and never conclude anything or sort anything out. I, yeah, I'm, I don't think of myself as an artist, but I, I get exactly what you're saying. And, you know, yeah, there are degrees, obviously yeah. on the one spe end of the spectrum, there's an entertainer who says, Hey, the audience wants this. I'm going to give them this, yeah. you know, and go out there and say, Hey folks, you know, and give them the thing that they love. And then you make a lot of money from that. That is clearly entertainment and not art. And then there's somebody who just creates things because they love to, and they want to. And like you said, there's a vision in their head. I mean, it's just like Michelangelo described it like that. Like there's this thing in my head and I just have to get it out or whatever. That's always, art, you know? <laughs> uh, well, I have to say, I, I mean, to add to what I said earlier about, you know, it's all me or, you know, that, that these are things that I want to get out. I have always like on the, there's always been this competing urge of not wanting to be a, a wanker, you know, of, of, like sitting and, oh, I'm going to make things that I understand. And, you know, I don't want to be that person. I think it's important. It's important to communicate and to make other people laugh. I think that's a really good thing. Yeah. And that's the other thing that I think differentiates maybe some fine art from some really well-crafted entertainment that achieves the level of artistic work is that it's accessible. Yeah. It's not, I mean, any asshole can make something that appeals to them and gives a big, big middle finger to everyone else. That's right. not a, much of an accomplishment. No, But no, I, I mean, that's, I do like it when people laugh. And I know ahead of time kind of what's going to make people laugh. Not flawlessly, but you can tell. You put a dumb cat on something, people are going to love it. Put a, a human penis on a bird and <laughs> for, it's going to get example. a laugh. <laughs> yeah. That is going to get a laugh. Yeah. Boy, the things people do. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, I want... I don't want to just be jerking off alone in a little room and, and feeling smug about it. I really like when people laugh. I just have to be able to laugh at it too. And, right. and, and it has to, it has to be satisfying in a way that's sustainable to me so that I don't burn out or feel obligated. Do you equate it with Dada at all? Not much. Okay. You know, I, I see the similarities and things like that. And I see the, I mean, I'm very much a fan of absurdity and, non sequiturs and things like that. But, but I don't think much about uh, the reading I've done about art is very limited. And I certainly, uh, I've seen things reading about surrealism that I like, like the paranoiac approach mm. where the world is, is crafted to, you know, by people who know what's going on when you don't things like that. I mean, those ideas appeal to me, you know, in, in a creative sense, because it, it opens up a whole bunch of ideas and, you know, there's things that, that I've seen in art writing that certainly appeal to me. There's a, a book of surrealism I have says something like surrealism is not about uh, the way the world is, but a way it could be like with a, sh a hmm. sort of, I always took it like a, a little shove to the side. You know, there's really not much difference between the stuff on some of Liar Town, the absurdities of Liar Town and the what we take for granted in, you know, everyday life. Right. So that reminds me of how I think of a comedy story, like in The Onion. It's it's real, but it's just skewed just a little bit. Mm -hmm. So there's like one unreal element yeah. that makes it funny. Yeah, just kicked slightly off the track, right. but in the same direction. And taken seriously as if it yeah. were real. Yeah, driven by the same set of, of like, you, you kick it a little bit and then you just let it go and you see, like, the same forces would see work it on goes. it. You know? Yeah. I feel like you touch on some of that in your work, that feeling that you're talking about, about this 
paranoid world where people who know better are creating the world and you're just living in it. Yeah. And it's a subtle thing, but I feel like a, a lot of the subtext of your work is, is sort of knocking the authorities down a peg, the authorities who produce magazines that we look mm -hmm. at or, or write copy, uh, marketing copy or any, any sort of presentational thing. Yeah. This is the subtext I get from a lot of your parody. And I think part of what makes it richly funny is because you are kind of mocking an authority in that way. Mm -hmm. uh, are you yeah. conscious of that? Very much. Um, I was writing the, uh, the intro. I'm doing a crap hound book and I'm writing the intro. Will it collect all the issues? Of no, the no, it's not an anthology. It's a giant book of unhappiness. The crap hound big <laughs> book of unhappiness. <laughs> Great. So it's 550 something pages. Wow. of Just misery. But well, that sounds wonderful. It, I had to do my least favorite thing, which is write a, write introspectively. And I was thinking what I realized that there is, I had an epiphany about the liar town and crap hound and the thing they have in common is that they, uh, like crap hound is, is where all this stuff is documented. Like the, the tricks people use, the thing that the guiding principle to both is that everyone's using the same tricks. I feel very strongly about that. In any kind of media or presentational, informational, anything. In every corner of society you can point to. The tricks that you know because you're a designer and you do that. You yeah. use the tricks. Yeah. So Crap Hound is where kind of the stuff gets documented. It, it, I don't alter it. I don't arrange it in necessarily funny ways or anything like that. I put like with like is pretty simple. But Liar Town is where I get to tweak things and, and play with the rules. So, yeah, there's a definite... That's the, the, I realizing that I was like, oh good, now I've got something to write about. But I had, uh, I wasn't clear on that for most of the, most of my life. That's great. When you can discover something like that. Yeah. Tell me about your writing process. So many of your <clears throat> jokes are so funny <laughs> and they're based on, like I said, so many of the different tools of satire. Like you use a lot of non sequitur and madcap and just funny sounds, wordplay, yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. All mixed together and your fake names are just masterful. <laughs> <laughs> like uh, what thought process, if any, goes into like how many names do you create before you select the ones that you use? And they're they're just just inherently funny sounding names. Yeah. It almost defies description. You look at the name, like you have fake credits for seventies TV shows. Yeah. It's just a have, like, name. Executive dump. producer, producer, and they're just really funny names. It's so much of like, that's liar town is often some of the posts are literally just vehicles that I needed to make to get a name, a fake name, you know, one that was like gnawing at you from yeah. the inside. And yeah. You just had to put it or out. that it that's sounds great. like a certain demographic. Like I want to okay. do, I want to do something with like a comedian or a magician named Todd McChrystal. That sounds perfect to me. It's the exact kind of stage name. It's the right kind of shitty, you <laughs> right. know? So I like that's in my head lately and I know I'm going to do something with that one day and I just have to figure out the vehicle for it. So they bubble up. Yeah. You're not like making lists. And... No, I'm, they both. They, <laughs> okay. I'm, they bubble up. I put them on a list, and then I go okay. back. And and I, you know, I've seen people talk about that creative process where you you put it in somewhere and you go back to it. See it whenever. with fresh eyes. Yeah, it's yeah. priceless. So I've got on my phone. I have little you know text note documents where I just like that one's for names. That one's for Liar Town. This one's for just regular idea book stuff. And then what about some of like the jokes, like some of the copy that you write? Same well, thing? I feel like first I'm going to, I laugh at my own stuff. I feel, I don't know if everyone does that. when you're Not interview. everyone, but it's great that you do. I, I think it's great. Because it feels, still feels like I just stumbled on it. Like it doesn't feel like I made it. Like I, oh, good one, Sean. doesn't sound like that to me. It sounds like, oh, I remember laughing at that as it occurred to me. Yeah, I've had that on occasion. It's a rare treat. Oh, it's constant to, for that's me because so I don't feel connected necessarily to. That's great. You just captured it from the transom or something. Yeah, yeah. It yeah. really like it, I remember where I was in this parking lot when I thought of that and started laughing, and that's the kind of thing that's that led to initially going back writing on those little scraps of paper. Just like, God damn it, I'm laughing at this stupid thing. I should save that. You know, anything that's text in Liar Town, any promo copy on a magazine, any description copy on any piece of marketing any actual copy that you write it, ha it has jokes in it uh 
Okay, well, I can say, too, I just realized this goes back to um, my desire to to do something for, like, to, to not exclude people. Maybe that's a good way to say it. I feel guilty about some of these things are so lightweight. You know, they really are. They're just not, whatever. They don't try to be, but I feel guilty sometimes when they're a little too lightweight. So I put more in there for people. Like, if, oh, if they have to look at this and roll their eyes at it at least i'm going to give them a shitload of you know fake names or or some turn of phrase that also occurred to me but a lot of stuff is done to like i've got the idea i know what i need and then i have these blank spots where on the magazine cover the blurbs will go or or whatever on the fake cd these are where the songs are so that just becomes a, a conduit for more nonsense and and i think of it as a dumping ground you know, just this is here. I'm going to put the things that that I think are funny, but they're not necessarily related or whatever. They're not necessarily none of them are masterworks, but there's 50 of them. So, you know, well, don't complain, I think, is the right, idea. Right, right. I like that about it because each piece, each post does feel consistent. Like mm -hmm. they're, they don't feel like they don't belong, even though they are very varied. Yeah. And that must be why, because like sometimes you do go for a really easy joke, but then there's, <laughs> and those are fun. And people, I think myself included, are totally going to enjoy that Yeah, because it comes within the context of a lot of really interesting jokes and there's a nice variety. They can't all be serious, important jokes. Some of them have to be light. I don't know. I mean, I, can you think of a single serious, important joke that I made? I mean, no. I know I'm putting you on the spot, but... No, I can't. But I, when I say serious and important, I mean something with, like, you know, really meaningful subtext. Like we were just talking about that paranoid idea of the world, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. people presenting information to you. What gives them the authority to right, do that? Right, right, right. That's very interesting. But then, you know, there'll just be another wacky, you know, funny... Um, uh, mittens or like, you know, <laughs> a, a stupid porn magazine parody. That's just a stupid sex joke or whatever, yeah, you yeah, know, and it's just a yeah. really nice mix. Yeah. That's, that's good. I mean, I'm very happy that that's how it comes off. Cause that's what I try to, I, I don't want to fall into the same rut and, and do the same thing over and over again. Or if I have to, like, if I really am driven to, you know, which I am occasionally, I, like I said, to put things in for other people like here, right. Sorry. It's an apology. You know, they have to sit through this, but you know, at least, at least I worked hard on it. So, you know, I'm not being lazy about it. I may be unsatisfying, but I wasn't lazy, you know? Yeah, no, you definitely don't get the sense that you're lazy reading Liar Town. I noticed by the way that you haven't posted in a long time as of this recording. Oh yeah. What's yeah, going on? Nothing much. I mean, I've been putting down ideas. I mean, there's a huge backlog of stuff oh, I want to okay. get done. There's nothing uh, tragic or whatever. I just, I took time to do the book, the Liar Town book. Right. And then, because I was so exhausted, I thought, why don't I do the Crap Hound book immediately after, you know? And so it's it's getting, it's in the final stage, the final stretch. But um, I just, these are things that I've been working on for five or six years and so I wanted to get them done and you know rather than try and half-ass it and I, I've been making stuff kind of but it the moment I start another Liar Town post I realize like I've got this is going to take an indeterminate amount of time and I have to do this thing right now so I'm just going to knock these books out and then get back to it it's an official sabbatical so you have your day job and then you do Liar Town you're working on these books at night Mm -hmm. Do you have any kind of social life? Do you live with anyone? Uh, no, nope, don't live with anyone. Uh, I see friends. Friends know by now that the way to get me is call up and say, hey, we're at this place. Do you want to come and meet us? Rather than, hey, what are you doing? You know, Do you want to maybe do something, think of something together? I, that won't You fiber. don't want the pressure of having to come up with an idea of what to do? Well, also it's L.A. and, you know, everyone pretends that, oh, come to this thing. It's only like 20 minutes. Like, what, why are you lying about how long things take? Like it takes me 45 minutes to drive there. It could take another half hour to find parking. Right. Then the thing is 20 minutes. Then it's another 45 minutes back. Uh, you know, stop bullshit. That's too much time. Yeah. It's like, it's just not going to happen that way. But uh, people, I, I work until someone kind of knocks me out of it until someone disturbs me and says, Hey, come to this thing. And they, and the chances of me accepting go up 
the easier it is, you know. So your natural impetus would just be to stay at home mm-hmm. and keep working. Yep. And do you appreciate being yanked out of that or not? Yeah, sometimes I do. I do. And I've, you know, sometimes I do it just because I don't like I remember, oh, I've told that person no the past three times they ask that you're being a you're being an asshole and a bad friend. Go do this thing. It's not like some, you know, martyrdom. I go and, you know, <laughs> count the moments to leave, but but I have to remind myself like you're it's not a necessarily a good life. You could do the most productive thing, but it's not necessarily going to make you a happy human being. Go go be with friends and have fun and, you know. Well, that's a very healthy perspective. <laughs> yeah, that's that's me, Mr. Healthy. <laughs> but you're trying, it sounds like. I am. You're trying to be healthy, even though it sounds like your uh, natural state would be to descend into unhealth. Or uh, I, I don't want to find out what it would descend into. Like, I don't think it would be terrible. I mean, I'd go for walks and stuff like that. I'd be like a recluse. Like we were See, talking. I dream of that. <laughs> yeah. I dream of be- seeing how long I can be alone. And and I think it would be transcendently beautiful. I really do. <laughs> but the question becomes, if it's like the deal with the devil, would getting what you want really make you happy? You know, I mean, we don't necessarily know that, you know, yeah, if we get to be alone exactly as much as our heart desires, that might backfire. You know, it's like someone like friends and social stuff. It's you could think of it as medicating yourself you know right. you're you're giving yourself these little doses of this human element oxytocin perhaps yeah even. yeah and like someone who who uh you know feels that well i'm i'm on my meds and i feel fine i don't need the meds anymore what would that you know that doesn't go well so right right maybe you know pushing oneself to do these things that kind of seem like pains in the asses now and then i can you know i'm willing to do it i don't think I think also I need, uh, like I wouldn't be happy in rural Montana as much as I want to be away from people sometimes. I don't think being out there, I'd want, I'd start craving input stimulus, you know, and I think kind of, especially with what I do with Liartown and stuff like that, it depends on incoming images and, and things that are unplanned. Do you absorb a lot of media and do you read a lot or mm-hmm. do you feel like you get stuff from personal interaction with people media i mean online stuff you know i yeah i i look and search out these weird things and and also in looking for pictures you find all these subcultures of people you know the the ones who collect this magazine or that magazine so and then you you know how easy it is to go down a rabbit hole online yes so yeah i i mean i try and maintain a steady flow of that stuff and yeah and and you know being on I, I still like to, I treat Twitter as read only. I don't post anymore, but it's, you can see the, the trends rise and fall, you know, sometimes in a matter of weeks, mm-hmm. you know, the dumb sayings go and, and flare up and then vanish. So I like watching things from a distance. That sounds, it sounds very recluse like, but. uh, almost voyeuristic. Sort of, but there's no deep pleasure. It's just a, a byproduct of looking online for these pictures and, and being, right. you know, it, it's interesting and fascinating from an anthropological standpoint, but I don't, voyeuristic makes it seem like a substitute for something. And it's not. I understand. I get <laughs> I, you. I'm thinking about it and I'm pretty sure it's not. Yeah. Are you in or have you been in serious relationships? Because you seem like a very single and happy to be single person. Yeah, I have. But, you know, how far do you want to put tears in your voice and make, you know, what kind of vague comment do you want to make? No, I, uh, I'm not in a serious relationship at the moment. I realize, like, I'm a bad boyfriend if I'm trying to work and everything like that. So I, it, it just seems like a lot of trouble right now. So I just want, and, and I am getting these books done, and I feel like if I can just shit this watermelon, I'll be happier and and. I have more time and I don't know if that's true but yeah I haven't uh sought it out and I don't like yeah I've been much less social than than in past years so it hasn't been a priority yeah it sounds like your work you're married to your work yeah and I've obviously gone through stages like that as well and it can be you know it's very isolating and 
I don't mind that. And it seems like you don't mind it either. Just no, to have this all. thing that you can focus on that's not yourself, yeah. but it just doesn't happen to be another person. It happens to be your work, yeah. your art, yep. dare I mean, we say. <laughs> I, I just want to get things you know, done a little. I feel like doing these things kind of gets one over on life or death or something you know like i just want to get it done and then i'll i'll feel that it's finished and other stuff will come up but but it's important to do things and have them finished rather than like a bunch of vague you know projects that are underway forever i want to finish this stuff and then and then i'll go hold hands with someone and do you feel compelled to <laughs> contribute memes to the culture by putting work out there and having it be a part of the cultural mm -hmm. legacy? No. That I, doesn't do anything for you? Zero. Less than zero. Don't need to leave any kind of mark on this world? Well, you're, I thought you were talking about memes in particular, like the, the internet culture. In, no, I meant in the original meaning of that word, the way that genes are evolution's way of perpetuating your seed. The, the, the memes, original Yeah, the original meaning yeah, was... Yeah, like bits of, of cultural virus that transmit from exactly, person to person. Yeah. I don't have, I don't ever think about that in that way. Um, I also periodically think about what well, I'm this sort of bleak existentialist view of like, well, we're all going to die and it's, and it's all vanity, you know, but I'm pretty cool with that. Like, this is what we do. I'm a human being and this is what human beings do. And, you know, not everything has to be some eternal, whatever. If you're looking for eternal satisfaction, you're going to be unhappy. You're going to have a shit time. Yeah, better set your sights low. Yeah, and you'll be pretty satisfied. Yeah, like I'm, I'm an animal that's pretty happy being an animal, you know. And I, I um, don't. I think about. I'm periodically reading something, and I realize, like, oh, that person, you know, they invent like these people that invented these amazing technologies or did these incredible artworks so far ahead of their time or whatever. And I haven't thought of them in ten years since I last read about them. If people forget about everyone, it's. To, to use that as a benchmark of success or happiness, I think, is a huge mistake. I, I'm so far less than them, and if I were expecting more than they got, it's not going to happen, <laughs> you know? Well, you're doing fine by my book, and I will continue to enjoy your work and wish you all the success as you continue doing it. Thank you very much. And it's been a delight talking to you, Sean. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. If you enjoyed this episode of the How to Write Funny podcast, give it a like and a review on iTunes. For more podcasts, subscribe or binge on the podcast playlist on the How to Write Funny YouTube channel.